Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to Book Trek 2023. <laughs> this is a BookTube event, the Summer of Trek. It's taking place all summer long, June, July, and August. It was uh, It's spearheaded by Vin at Revenant Reads, who has assembled a valiant bridge crew of Star Trek fans to read Star Trek fiction all summer long. In addition to all the other demands that BookTube is making on your time, to read Star Trek fiction, maybe rewatch the shows, maybe rewatch some of the movies, uh, maybe have a live stream. If it would ever be possible to get this bridge crew together for a live stream, but people have lives and personal responsibilities and families and friends and personal hygiene, and it gets in the way. Uh, but I have been enthusiastically participating, and unlike previous Book Trek events, Book Trek 2023, the summer of Trek, is very loose. The, we are not going, uh, we're not progressing franchise by franchise, time period by time period, anything like that. Instead, you, just reading Star Trek all summer long, you can you can chart a course of your own or just go at random. And I have been going at random for a few BookTube events in the course of 2023, just in general, not just this summer, but just in general. I have been sort of spinning a wheel for my nightly reading and adding something to the night's pile of books without really planning ahead of time what it is. Uh, and that has led to some really good surprises, led to some duds, but when it comes to the Summer of Trek, I have some larger questions in mind about myself as a reader and a Star Trek fan that are I want answered, I want to test them, and I, the only reason that they're on my mind is because of changes that have happened to me because of Book Trek. I went into Book Trek 2021 Loving Star Trek and hating the next generation. I called it the boring Star Trek, the boring generation. Uh, I didn't like it when it was on TV. I thought it was talky and pokey and boring and preachy. And with almost, almost no sense of the dramatic flair or the character interaction that I loved about the original series, my Star Trek. And it was in the course of Book Trek, hearing from all of you, also dealing with my co-host, for most of whom, the next generation is their Star Trek. It's, it was really, really important to them in a lot of ways, not just science fiction-wise, but also personally. And I already knew that there were Trek fans out there like that, but I, I before BookTube, I had the luxury of dismissing them. I had the luxury, the luxury of not knowing them. So I could say, yeah, yeah, great. You're a hopeless poindexter. Of course you would like this kind of boring, tedious show. Uh, it was only once I knew some people and, and got... That I, that I started to realize there might be more going on here than I thought. And I watched, I rewatched a lot of The Next Generation. I rewatched all of the movies. One of The Next Generation movies I consider to be one of the best Star Trek movies ever made. In terms of exactly those parameters, the, the sheer effortless chemistry of the bridge crew for The Next Generation. And another thing that helped me a little were the first two seasons of Star Trek Picard, where John, where, uh, Patrick Stewart reprises his role as a much older and more thoughtful, wintry John Luke Picard. It's an amazing casting coup, and uh, the first season of John Luke Picard has some really interesting things in it, and the second season of John Luke Picard, uh, of Star Trek Picard, has some interesting things in it. I don't think either one of those seasons really is a success, but Watching one of the themes that runs through those first two seasons, uh, there are other themes that I won't I won't drone about. I won't I won't yell about them. But one of the themes that runs through them is a hundred year old admiral uh, l assessing his life, and ne necessarily therefore assessing the part of his life that was the crew that was the next generation in adventures. Whenever the seasons, whenever those seasons successfully touch on that. Uh, I thought it was really good. Uh, it doesn't often do that. It wasn't often really good. Then came the third season of Star Trek Picard, uh, which is brilliant. It's amazingly good. And you, some of you, maybe the cynical among you, will say, well, you only like it because it's all fan service. If you're going to do a series called Star Trek Picard and you're going to cast Patrick Stewart as John Luke Picard... You had better set your hope on doing some effective fan service. You certainly can't do that and then attack your fans the way the first two seasons do. The reason why you do something like that at all is for fan service. Uh, but it isn't. The third season of Star Trek for Heart is a, has a lot more going on in it than fan service. It's really, really well done. And amazingly, after all this time, 
that chemistry between the bridge crew is still there, even though in the context of the show, a lot of them have changed drastically as people. Uh, I loved it, and because I loved it, I loved it before Book Trek 2023 launched, but that led me to think about an experiment, or to question myself as a reader. It's not just a question. I brought this up yesterday with, uh, with the, the Star Trek book that I read yesterday. I'm wondering, I was, I'm wondering, will my increased appreciation for The Next Generation, which I got through Book Trek, and will my sharpened appreciation for that bridge crew, which I got from Star Trek Picard Season 3, would that affect my reading of Next Generation novels? Is in t back in 2021, when I was doing Book Trek, I found, was finding mostly duds among Next Generation novels. I read a lot of them. And I, I was mostly not liking what I was reading. And in the context of Book Trek 2023, I started to ask myself, is it possible that a part of what you didn't like about those books was bleeding over from your dislike of the show? Which was still clinging to me in 2021. I, is it possible that a greater appreciation of the characters that maybe the authors of those books had and you didn't have is what you would need in order to really enjoy these books. Now, that's not a legitimate co a quality of a novel. But Star Trek fiction, they're, they're pastiche novels. And therefore, it is legitimate. It's, it, doesn't make, it doesn't elevate their literary quality, but it is a legitimate thing to talk about. Your simpatico with the characters of any, of any product is an active part of your appreciation of pastiche stuff about that product. That goes without saying, although I didn't seem to see it. I certainly didn't see it as clearly as I could have uh, back in 2021. So for Book Trek, Summer of Trek, for Book Trek 2023, I want to read a lot of Next Generation novels from 30 years ago and see if I don't like that better. Not because the books are any better, but because I am more tuned now. I now like that chemistry more. I understand what's going on. Yes, it's a, in a lot of ways very different from the original series that I love so much. But it is legitimate on its own, and I didn't see that until until Congress, with a lot of next-gen fans, really opened my eyes up to it, and then Star Trek Picard Season 3 really finalized that. Uh, so I want to read more next-generation novels for the Summer of Trek to see if that bleeds over and I like them better. But the real acid test for this, as a test for myself, will be to reread a Next Generation novel that I didn't like in 2021. And that's what I did last night. I reread Rogue Saucer by John Vornholt, which I did a video on back in 2021. I'm not going to keep doing this. I'm not going to keep revisiting books. But I did this as a test. Would I like this better? And I did. I don't think that my increased liking of it had anything to do, really, with what Vornholt is doing on the page. Not much. I might have missed a few nuances that he's throwing in there for next-gen fans. Legitimately speaking, this is for next-gen fans. Who would buy this thing and read it? Other than a lunatic in 2021 who didn't like this, this series. But who would buy it? It's for next-gen fans. And he's writing it that way. He's writing it for them. Which means that chapters and certain moments, certain bits of dialogue, are going to have nuances that they're going to pick up. And I flatter myself that now I have reached a point where I will pick those up. And I did. I did pick those up. Enough, for instance, for me to be a little bit pickier about whether or not certain characters are in character. If you'd have talked to me before Book Trek, I'd have said it's not possible for next-gen characters to be in or out of character, because despite the fact that so much spotlight is put on data, they're all androids. <laughs> but that is not true. And now I see that. Now I see that very clearly. So I was able to pick out which characters are done well in this book and which ones aren't. Uh, for instance, I think there are several there are several moments in this book where Picard himself is done wrong. Uh, Riker is spot on. L Jordy LaForge is spot on. It's not hard to do Worf well, I don't think. Uh, but this, like I mentioned in 2021, I don't expect any of you to go back and watch that video, but like I mentioned in 2021, this is a story of uh, the Enterprise is chasing a, a, a ship that they suspect is owned and operated by the Maquis. The Maquis are a terrorist group of disaffected Federation citizens, including quite a few disaffected Federation Starfleet officers, who 
violently object to the fact that the Federation made a kind of armed truce with the Cardassians that included the establishment of a DMZ, of a demilitarized zone. The Marquis say, no, no, you, that is fundamentally betraying the worlds who were conquered by the Cardassians that are in the demilitarized zone. It's a fundamental betrayal of those worlds and all the people on them. We must fight the Cardassians in order to make them give up those worlds. We don't cede them as part of some demilitarized zone for the greater peace. Hence was born the group called the Marquis. And they play a role in Deep Space Nine and the uh, the Next Generation and also Voyager. They play they play a role. It's a tricky ethical thing. It's the kind of thing that is that I now appreciate the Next Generation routinely did, which was to raise adult questions, adult ethical questions, nuanced questions about power and responsibility and right and wrong. It's no surprise to me now. Looking back now, I feel terrible at all the caustic remarks I've made in the last thirty years because. Almost invariably, now that I look at it with a little bit of a broader lens, I see that that intellectual vitality, that ethical unwaveringness, the one thing about Captain Picard, he's, I think, the most, the most just technically intelligent of all of the star captains in Star Trek, but he's also the most ethical, instantly ethical. He is an ironbound creature of ethics. And when I look at that sort of thing, I can't help but see it reflected in the next-gen fans that I've known in my life. It makes me feel a little bit bad of how much I've teased them over the years. Uh, but uh, the next generation introduced this concept of terrorists who are not bad guys. That's a pretty amazing thing. And they went one step further. Because they gave us a character, a Bajoran woman. The Bajorans, of course, have more reason to sympathize with and join the Marquis than anyone else in the Alpha Quadrant. Because their planet, Bajor, was brutally occupied directly by the Cardassians. Now, the, the, the treaty that we're talking about here that established the demilitarized zone also booted the Cardassians off of Bajor. They're not allowed to, to own this planet anymore. But... That's, there are long memories, long angers among the Bajorans. And the next generation introduces us to a Bajoran woman, a Starfleet officer named Ro Lyren, who defects to the Marquis. It's, it's, a, it's, it's very well done. That episode, the one, one episode in particular, is very well done. But I have to confess, uh, it wasn't that episode I was thinking about when I reread this book, when I was rereading this book. Ro Lyren plays a prominent part in this book. And I wasn't thinking about that episode. I was thinking about Star Trek Picard Season 3, where Ro Laren returns. The actress gets to reprise her role and does an unbelievably good job. Now, the whole arc with Ro Laren is wonderful in Star Trek Picard Season 3. I won't do any spoilers, because some of you, including I think some of my co-hosts from Book Trek, haven't seen it yet. Uh, that whole arc is well done. But there is one scene between her and Picard that is incredible. It is just incredible writing. The writing in the third season of Star Trek Picard is amazing anyway. But there is a scene between these two characters. To put it mildly, they have a history. And that scene is wonderfully done. It very specifically is not simply Ro Laren apologizing or yelling or John Luke Picard apologizing or yelling. Instead, it's so... It's such a tribute to the next generation, the TV series, by respecting the intelligence of the people who are watching it. It cannot possibly be puppies and rainbows, and both characters know it. It is amazingly well done. And I loved that scene, I applauded it, and I wondered going into this book, all right, well, you now know Ro Laren's story. You, know, you, you have now had that amazing moment. Those of you who have watched the season will know exactly what I'm talking about, the moment that I'm talking about. It stands out, even among a, a show, a season, that is full of great moments. I, when I was reading this, I wondered, all right, well, is that going to filter in? Is that going to filter back onto this book? John Vornholt is a fairly pedestrian writer. I'm not saying that this is a gem that I didn't see the first time. I'd be a pretty bad book critic if I was intently reading this book two years ago and missing a gem. I wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't missing a gem. But, like I mentioned, how much you like, you personally enjoy, how much you're a fan of whatever it is that's being pastiche, whether it's Star Trek or... Babylon 5 or anything else, whatever it is, however much you're a fan of that thing will affect how much you will enjoy the book. It allows you to swallow great heaping piles of garbage, which this is not. This is a competently done book. You'll enjoy it. 
it, but it allows you to swallow great heaping piles of garbage with a smile on your face if you love the thing enough. Uh, this is this is a, the, the the Enterprise is chasing a, a vessel that they believe may be commandeered by the Maquis, or that is at least straying into the DMZ, and they're not allowed to do that. And it turns out that ship is under the control of the Marquis, and they manage through a techno babble endeavor to damage the saucer section of the Enterprise D. Massively, importantly, so the Enterprise D can't shake it off, and they can't do it on. They can't fix it themselves. They have to go to a starbase. They go to a starbase to fix that saucer section. And while they're at it, Jordy LaForge, the engineer on the Enterprise, suggests that they get it refitted. They might as well, while they're there anyway, it's going to be a week that they're going to be in, you know, at shore leave, they might as well do it. Uh, and while they're on shore leave at this space station, they're no sooner there, their boots are no sooner on the ground, than, than Picard is contacted by Admiral Necheyev, who's another character from The Next Generation. You would have to know The Next Generation, you'd have to be a fan of the show to know her, but she is a fan favorite. Fans love her, they can't get enough of her showing up in a novel. Uh, she's John Luke Picard's superior, and she's a lot like him in that she doesn't really tolerate imperfection. She's a hard ass, which I think I think even Next Generation fans would would have to admit that Picard is too, in a way that Kirk was not, uh, in a way that even Janeway is not. I, yeah, uh, in at one point in this book, Picard is talking with a Vulcan who used to, who used to work with Admiral Che of years and years ago. And asked, he asked the Vulcan, what's the secret to getting along with her? And the Vulcan says, don't make any mistakes. <laughs> uh, but the Admiral wants to test a saucer section of a Galaxy-class ship. The saucer section in these ships can detach from the rest of the ship. And theoretically, they are built to withstand crash landing on a planet. But all the, the uh, simulations that Starfleet has done has had them wrecked. The, the crash landing on a planet wrecks them. And Necheyev and a bunch of her engineers and her assistants want to create a saucer section that can not only survive completely intact and workable impact with a planet, but also re achieve orbit. Get back up into space. Uh, and they want to test this this prototype. And they've got a ship whose, whose saucer section is no longer in use, at least for a little while. They've got a crew that is experienced in, in using that saucer section, so she drafts Picard and he drafts his bridge crew, a large part of his bridge crew, to, to do this test. And when it comes time for them to head out and do this test, Admiral Chehov says she's coming along. Now, this is all this is ridiculous on a number of different levels. You would not have the, the, the highly decorated and invaluable bridge crew of a flagship of the Federation do a test of a new technology that involves crash landing on a planet, you might lose all of them. And even if you were somehow weirdly willing to do that, an admiral wouldn't go along just for the fun of it. She says she's going along just for the fun of it. In fact, you would do this whole thing automated. I hate to blow a hole in the book and in a lot of Star Trek fiction, but you would do the whole thing automated. And also, I realize that simulations don't give you every, anything, everything. But simulations in the 21st century are good enough for this sort of thing. In the 23rd century, I'd have to think, I, why couldn't you build a replicator as big as Earth's moon, replicate uh, a saucer section, and crash that <laughs> without any uh, highly experienced bridge crew on board? Uh, to say nothing of the fact that all of that, the whole of it, the whole idea, the whole romance of this book, that whole MacGuffin of a plot, we need to crash the saucer section of a ship to see what will happen. It did not spring from creativity, whatever little creativity John Vornhold is using in this book, or from any demands of the plot. The plot in this book is about the Marquis. And it, you, you, to give him credit, he does get around to that plot. Of course, the Marquis steal a saucer section. That's the whole point of the, of the title. Uh, and he deals with the, the ethical vagaries very well all throughout the book, far better than I saw the first time I read it. Uh, but the saucer section fixation of this book didn't spring from creativity. It didn't spring from any of the dictates of the plot. It sprang from a movie. <laughs> it sprang from Star Trek Generations, where Kirk meets Picard. And I love large parts of that movie. I think large parts of that movie are really, really good. But let's be honest. It has one incredible set piece. 
one amazing set piece, Star Trek set piece. So if you were to go through the Star Trek movies and you were to, uh, you know, signal out the set piece, the Battle of the Mutara Nebula in The Wrath of Khan, for instance, the stealing of the Enterprise in The Search for Spock, if you were to do that and go through, if you're lucky, a Star Trek movie will have a big set piece. And the big, undeniable set piece in Generations is that the saucer section detaches from the main body of the Enterprise-D and crashes on a planet. And it's wonderfully done. It's, it's such a set piece that the movie, the director decided to do it twice in the same movie. But it is, it is an amazing piece of filmmaking. Okay. It's now got its own book. <laughs> but the point here isn't that, that this is a, a gem that I missed the first time. The point here is that I liked it a lot more because I like The Next Generation a lot more. Anyway. And, so, and, and the, your love of the thing being pastiche is an active involvement in your liking of a pastiche. And I have to admit, Ro Laren, in the third season of Star Trek Picard, was on my mind the whole time I was reading this. And that's... That might not be fair. I, I'm not meaning it to be unfair. I'm certainly not elevating John Vornholt because of that. He had no hand in any of that. But it did help me to read this. I did, I did like this a lot more. So there, that was my little experiment for Book Trek, is to reread a Next Generation novel and see if I liked it more because I like the Next Gen more. And I did. I do. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. That's not a betrayal of any kind of critical ethos because it's not, that's, that element is not critical. That has nothing to do with the performance of the book. That's That's a function of pastiche of fan fiction. So, so there you go. I don't know how interesting any of this was, but I have now revisited a next generation novel. I'm going to once again, sort of go randomly tonight and see what I get. I have no idea what it will be. I don't know if it'll be next gen, another next gen novel. There are a lot of next gen novels. I think there are almost as many next gen novels as there are original series novels. So it could be that I will encounter one, but I'm basically going to spin a wheel tonight and see what happens. And I'll report back. On the USS Revenant, I'll report back tomorrow. So I will see you then. <laughs> Thank you, Book Tube.